Hey, good day guys, I trust you are well. Um, for today's lesson, this would be our English um, home language poetry and, and uh, the poem we will be discussing today is An African Thunderstorm. Let me just get to that for you, I'll bring it up and then um, we can have a look at it and discuss it after that. There we go. Okay, let me, let me read that for you. Uh, I trust you can all see that. Here we go. An African thunderstorm by David Rabatiri. From the west, clouds come hurrying with the wind, turning sharply here and there, like a plague of locusts whirling, tossing up things in its tail like a madman chasing nothing. Pregnant clouds ride stately on its back, gathering to perch on heels like sinister dark wings. The wind whistles by and trees bend to let it pass. In the village, screams of delighted children toss and turn. In the din of the whirling wind, women, babies clinging on their backs, dart about in and out madly. The wind whistles by whilst trees bend to let it pass. Clothes wave like tattered flags flying off to expose dangling breasts as jagged blinding flashes rumble, tremble and crack amidst the smell of fire smoke and the pelting march of the storm. Okay, I'll read it again. Stanza 1. From the west clouds come hurrying with the wind, turning sharply, here and there, like a plague of locusts whirling, tossing up things in its tail like a madman, chasing nothing. Pregnant clouds ride stately on its back, gathering to perch on heels, like sinister dark wings, the wind whistles by and trees bend to let it pass. In the village, screams of delighted children toss and turn in the din of the whirling wind. Women, babies clinging on their backs, dart about in and out madly. The wind whistles by and whilst whistle, whistles by whilst trees bend to let it pass. Clothes wave, wave like tattered flags flying off to expose dangling breasts as jagged blinding flashes rumble, tremble and crack amidst the smell of fired smoke and the pelting march of the storm. Okay, let's, let's have a look at the summary of this poem. This poem describes the energy and excitement of a storm. You will notice how this poem has been written. You will see that there's a lot of enjambment. Um, it's very evident in this poem. And I think the reason why they have used that particular poetic device is because they want to absolutely um, depict how chaotic this storm is, that everything just literally is rumbled off. There's the chaos that's happening, therefore they have not used many, if any, um, in a stanza, any um, punctuation. So. In the first two stanzas, the poet focuses on the effects of the natural elements of the storm, the, the wind and the clouds, as the storm is approaching. So there's the approach of the storm. Then, in the last stanza, the poet moves his focus to the people and the impact the storm has on them. The storm intensifies. The natural elements behave dramatically and terrifyingly. Um, and the effect is powerful and destructive. Let's go back there. Let's read it again. It says that the, in the first two stanzas, the, uh, the focus is on the effects of the natural elements uh, of the storm, on the winds and the clouds, and it's really giving us an indication that the storm is approaching. Then in the last stanza, the poet moves uh, his focus to the people and the impact the storm has on them the storm intensifies. The natural elements have dram behave dramatically and terrifyingly, uh, um, and the effect is powerful and destructive. So if we go back um, to the poem, um, you'll see it starts with, from the west the clouds come hurrying with the wind. You can see the clouds are gathering. Here and they're like a plague of locusts, whirling, tossing up things in its tail like a madman chasing nothing. Then when, when they say pregnant clouds, some of you will be able to identify already what poetic device they are using. The question is, can clouds be pregnant? If that is the case, yes. But if it's not the case, if the answer is no, you know that they've given a human quality 
to a dead thing and in that instance you are referring to personification. It also says that these, cry, these clouds ride stately on its back. Can a cloud ride? If the answer is no, then yes again, you'll see personification. It's gathering to perch on hills like sinister dark wings. Obviously now you see the word like. When you see the word like, you immediately know that they are making use of a simile in that instance. Um, and um, you know the sister or the coupling for a simile is a metaphor. How do we know or identify a, a simile? It's when we compare things using words such as, as, like, or then, and in this instance you will immediately uh, see they've used like sinister dark wings. The wind whistles by and trees bend to let it pass. Then it moves from those two stanzas. Everything is gathering. The clouds are gathering. The wind is gathering. Everything is set up for the uh, storm to have its day with the people. Now it moves to the village in the last two stanzas. In the village, screams of delighted children, they toss and turn in the den of the whirling wind. Women, um, and obviously while they're outside, they are clinging on their backs. They dart about in and out. They're running in and out madly. Then the wind whistles by whilst trees bend to let it pass. And that, that image you see there is of a tree that bends backward. And why would a tree be bending? It really, um, it symbolizes how uh, strong the winds or the force of the winds were, that the trees would bend backwards. Then clothes wave, clothes wave again. The clothes are waving. Again, you identify that as personification like tattered flags there's your word like again you will see that like again so it's a simile they are referring to flying off to expose dangling breasts as jagged blinding flashes rumble tremble and crack amidst the smell of fire smoke and the pelting march of the storm um when they are referring to the pelting march of the storm um it seems like the storm is coming on as if you have um, like a legion of, of um, uh, what do you call them, a, a troop or an army that's busy marching amidst the fight smoke and the pelting march of the storm. So you can see in this poem they're using strong imagery to, um, to, uh, to, to depict what is happening, the effects of a storm um, and what the results thereof would be. Let's go back to the text. Um, let's look at the, the theme of this poem, the literal theme. So you, they can ask you for um, what is the literal theme of this poem? What does it literally mean? You know when they ask you for what the literal theme would be or what something means literally, the next question would be, okay, if it's not literal, then what is um, um, the other? If it's not literal, then what, what's the other one? What, I, I'm going to get to that word now. So the literal or surface meaning of this poem is the chaos and destruction um, of a storm and the helplessness of the people caught in its paths. Literally. It's the surface. It's what, what's happening on the surface of this poem. It's the chaos. It's the destruction of a storm and the helplessness of the people caught in its path. However, there's another way to read this poem. The figurative way. It's the figurative meaning of this poem. Um, however, there's another way to see the storm in its negative effects as a metaphor. And you know a metaphor is when you compare things without using those words. And a metaphor, as we know it, is a direct comparison. So we're not saying you look like your mother. We are saying you are your mother. That's a metaphor. When you say she's a flower, um, that's a metaphor. So in this instance, they are using this whole poem um, in in the form of a metaphor. And what does it mean? The storm could stand for British and European colonialism and the destructive impact it had on the people of Africa. This second reading is possible if we consider the poet and the context in which he worked. So remember, we haven't read that yet in terms of the context of the poem, the poet himself, but I'm going to read this to you. He was part of the first Malawian government after independence from Britain 
and he stood for the rights of people to rule themselves and to, to determine how they live their lives. So it could be that he's referring to the figurative meaning of himself as an activist. He was part of the first Malawian government of independence from Britain and he stood for the rights of people to rule themselves and to determine how they live their lives. Okay, great. Let's discuss the title. The title locates the poem in Africa, uh, the indefinite article, and suggests, you remember we spoke in grammar about an, a, a definite article and an indefinite article. So the definite article would be the word the, because we can definitely um, narrow it down to something. So if we say um, they caught the 7 um, p.m. train, it is a definite article. If it is an indefinite article, you would, it would read, um, they caught a particular train. I saw a man. So it's indefinite, but I saw the man is definite. Let's read it again. So the title says, an African thunderstorm. That's an indefinite article. What does it suggest? It suggests that the poem is about a generalized rather than a specific event. So it's a generalized event instead of a specific one. The word thunderstorm tells us that the poet will focus on this natural event. So a thunderstorm is a natural event and it's a generalized uh, event. The type and form of this poem, um, very easy, you can see that it has three stanzas and is written in free verse. We all know what free verse is, obviously, I assume. Free verse means that the poem is free of verse or rhyme. So there's no rhyming scheme in this particular poem. That's free verse. The lines are of different lengths and many lines have only a single word. I almost want to say the following. It's almost easy to understand why this poem is written in free verse. Again, um, to, to emphasize the chaotic feeling that this poem, nothing is structured, chaotic feeling of the storm, nothing is structured, nothing rhymes, um, certain lines are, are longer, some other, other lines are shorter, then there's lines with just one word in it, and that's, that's what could happen in the case of a storm, everything happens rapidly just like that. Um, the first two stanzas are short to set up the advancing aspects of the storm and build up of the tension, build up the tension, and then the last stanza is longer and describes the effect of the storm on people and how they are at the mercy of the power of the elements. There we go. We have already discussed that. Let's look at the imagery um, in this poem. Remember what imagery is. Imagery is when they use certain um, graphic um, explanations, when they use certain pictures. What pictures are they using? To bring across a certain feeling or a certain mood or a um, to describe a certain scene. So here we go. In stanza one, the images of the storm and its elements, the clouds and the wind, are frightening. Let's read what they say. And what gives us that feeling? The clouds are compared to a plague of locusts. Can you imagine that? That's how crazy it gets. Then there's the simile suggests destruction it's like a plague of locusts and that is what you have there that in particular is let me just highlight that for you why the simile so they will ask you for instance um they will ask you identify the poetic device using that used in that particular line then you will say it's a simile and then after you have said that they will definitely ask you um Explain the use of the simile in that particular line. What does it do? It suggests destruction. Because remember, a plague of locusts would come to destroy a field or a crop. Because of the way the locust descends on a field and crops and wipe out everything that is growing in a matter of minutes, causing starvation. Then, the wind. We are still talking about the image that they are using. Um, to um, to identify or emphasize the storm and its elements. 
and the issue the word we are using is frightening what makes it frightening one the plague of locusts they used like a plague of locusts that's a simile remember that and it would then emphasize the way locusts descend on a field and crops and wipe out wipe out everything in a um, in a matter of minutes then the wind is compared to a powerful animal tossing up things on its tail a powerful animal can you imagine being in, in uh, Jurassic Park um, with powerful animals those dinosaurs tossing up things on its tail this you can see from line 8 this is a metaphor what does it do it reinforces the animal savage savagery savagery of locusts similar to uh, two lines earlier again it reinforces that savagery image of the locusts in the last line the wind is compared to a madman chasing nothing and this simile tells us about the frightening unpredictability of the coming storm a madman chasing nothing i want you to see that image what does the simile do? It tells us about the frightening unpredictability of the coming storm. If you go back to the poem, you'll see at the end, um, clothes are like, oh, here we go, here we go, here we go. Pouting out of the storm, we want to go. In the village, kings of delight, the children toss and turn. In the din of the whirling wind, in the um, women, babies, Cling on their backs, dart about in and out. The wind whistles by and whistles, tree and and whilst trees bend to let it pass. There we go. Here we go. Here we go. Here we go. This is where we want to be. We want to be in stanza one. From the west, clouds come hurrying with the wind, turning sharply here and there, like a plague of locusts. We we discussed that simile over there. Now we want to talk about like a madman chasing. We're asking. Why is that simile being used like a madman chasing? It's telling us that um, the simile is telling us about the frightening and unpredictability of the coming storm. Now in stanza 2, let's read that quickly. Stanza 2 reads, Pregnant clouds ride stately on its back. So think about it stately, how you ride with dignity gathering to perch on heels like sinister dark wings. You've seen that simile there as well. The wind whistles by and trees bend to let it pass. Let's discuss the imagery using there. The clouds are being personified. Okay, so we're, we're talking about um, the fact that the, these images that we'll be discussing in stanza 2 reinforces the comparisons with frightening creatures. So we did talk about frightening creatures in stanza one. This one, however, in stanza two now reinforces those creatures and introduces a new image of the storm. The clouds are personified in the first three lines. Remember, we're giving um, human-like characters to the clouds now. One, they are pregnant in line 10, which suggests the weight of water they will release into the, onto the land. In other words, can you imagine a lady being six months pregnant, eight months pregnant, and then nine months pregnant? So the bigger or the longer the pregnancy is, obviously, the more growth or, or the more uh, the better the growth of the child is. It is fully developed before she gives birth. Now, in this instance, they are pregnant, and it suggests the weight of water they will release onto the land. And they ride stately. If they ask you in, in line 11, explain line 11, what does it mean when they say the clouds ride stately? It means they ride like queens, like dignity. In line 12, they are gathering like a group that has strength in numbers. They are gathering like a group. And when people gather in a group, when you go up to Toy Toy, it's better to gather in groups and there is strength in numbers. In line 13, the poet continues with an animal comparison, like dark, sinister wings. That simile is suggesting that the clouds are frightening birds of prey. Frightening birds of prey, like dark, sinister. Sinister 
gives you the eerie feeling of being frightened about something. So, that simile suggests that the clouds are frightening birds of prey. The image of the wind in the last line in which the trees bend to let it pass tells us that the wind meets no resistance which heightens its power. There we go. Stanza number three. In stanza three, the storm reaches a climax and the images of chaos and destruction reflect the impact on humans. Let's go to stanza number three. In the village, screams of delighted children toss and turn in the den of the whirling wind. Women, babies clinging on their backs, dart about in and out madly. The wind whistles by while trees bend to let it pass. It is. Clothes wave like tattered flags flying off to expose the dangling breast as jagged. Blinding flashes rumble, tremble and crack amidst the smell of fired smoke and the pelting march of the storm. I'll be with you in a minute. Let's go back here. Here we go. Okay. Initially in line 17. We are talking about images of chaos and destruction, um, and it reflects the, the impact it has on humans. Initially in line 17, there's a sense that the storm is fun because we hear screams of delighted children. And you can imagine what it feels like for kids to be playing outside and suddenly there is um, this, this growing storm. There's the, the feeling of the wind, there may be some, some raindrops, there may be the sound of, of thunder. So you can imagine it feels like it's you get these screams of delightedness of the kids. But this happy image is contrasted. You can underline the word contrast with the restlessness and uncertainty of the women as they dart about in and out madly in lines 22 to 24. And they are at the mercy of the storm. The simile in line 27 of the women's clothes being torn off like tattered flags is, remember tattered is, is torn, flags is an image of loss. So when something is torn, it's an image of loss. So they can ask you, um, identify what images are being used to, um, to um, reflect a sense of loss. It underlines a sense of uh, the sense of the storm as all-powerful and ruthless. Two meanings for tattered flags. It's an image of loss, and then it then underlines the sense of the storm as being all-powerful and ruthless. It will take everything away from you. In the last line, the metaphor in which the storm is compared to an army, that's the word I was looking for, an army, the pelting march of the storm. So an army would work one, two, three, four. It's when you pelt like that. Okay, so in which the storm is compared to an army, the, which the pelting march of the storm confer, confirms the storm as a destructive force, like an army. It is a destructive force. Let's talk about sound devices um, that we can identify in this poem. So remember we have four sound devices. Um, and um, if you can if you can name them up, number one would be assonance. That is the repetition of vowels in the same line. Then um, the following one would be alliteration. It's the repetition of consonants in the same line. Then you remember we have. Um, onomatopoeia, which is an actual sound device. It is the mimicking of a sound. Um, and the word is normally spelt the way it sounds, like drag or bang or boom or ba, whatever it is. And then um, the last one would be sibilance. Sibilance, as you can hear that word, is the repetition of the S sounds. She sells, she, she saw seashells on the seashore. So that is sibilance. Let's, let's have a look at what sound devices they used throughout this poem. Storms are noisy, and I mean, really, it's almost obvious that, you, that, they, that they would use sound devices in this poem. 
Storms are noisy events and thunderstorms are particularly frightening because of the noise. The poet has used a range of sound devices to create the effects of the wind, the rain, the thunder and the lightning. In stanza one there is onomatopoeia in lines two and seven with the words hurrying and whirling. Whirling is that that sound. So this word, as you get to the word whirling, you immediately get that feel. It, which sounds like wind rushing through the air. In stanza 2, the poet uses onomatopoeia in line 14 with whistles. Then in stanza 3, there are many sound devices. So in, let's go back. Onomatopoeia in lines 2 and 7 with the words hurrying and whirling. Then there's onomatopoeia in stanza 2 as well in line 40 with the word whistles. You can circle all of those words. There's alliteration in, alliteration in stanza um, 3, and this emphasizes the arrival of the storm. So, let's start with line 18. It's the word toss and turn. What, what does it do? It suggests the chaotic movement created by the strong wind. It becomes chaotic and therefore uses um, the alliteration in toss and turn, the repetition of the T sound. In line eight, 19, Again, there's onomatopoeia of din. It emphasizes the deep noise and the whirling continues the powerful movement and sound of the wind. There's the word whistles again in line 25 and this repetition emphasizes the ongoing noise. They may ask you, why is the word whistle uh, um, repeated in line 25? Your answer would be, it emphasizes the ongoing noise. Alliteration again in lines 27 and 28. The F sound, flags flying off, conscious of the sound of the clothes flapping uncontrollably in the wind. Flags flying off, remember the tattered flags, it's flying off. It then, it conscious of the sounds of the clothes flapping uncontrollably in the wind. Line 31 is dense with onomatopoeia. There's the word rumble, is the noise of the thunder, tremble. So as you call up these words, you must be able to tell us um, what it, what it uh, represents. So rumble represents the noise of the thunder. Tremble is the shaking effect of the thunder. Crack is the loud, frightening noise when thunder is very close. So those three words, rumble, the noise of the thunder, tremble. The shaking effect of the thunder. Crack the loud, frightening noise when the thunder is very close. Now let's talk about diction. Remember what diction is? Diction is, is the words used to create a certain tone or mood. What words are they using to say certain things in a certain way that creates a specific feeling within a poem? This poem is a good example of the power of the economy of uh, of the economy of poetry. In other words, how the careful choice of of just a few words can have immense effect and contribute towards the aesthetics or the beautiful qualities of the poem. Because this poem is about physical action in the world, the choice of verbs helps to build the dynamicism of the storm. The verbs relate to the movement and many of them are in a present participle form. Remember we discussed participles. Participles is ed and ing. So many of them, ed is the past participle, ing is the present participle. So many of them are ending with ing which means it's in the present which makes the verb seem more vivid. However, um, and, and when we do that it's almost like the storm is, um, is th there's this relentlessness, it just carries on. There's a hurrying, there's a turning, it's a whirling, there's a tossing, there's a chasing. And it all creates a sense of um, chaotic movement. The action continues with, there's more action, continues with, ride, a lot of verbs. Remember, verbs are action words, ride gathering, whistles, and bend in stanza 2, in stanza 3, we reach the climax of the storm with these verbs, toss, and turn, dart, whistles, 
way, flying. There are words such as rumble, um, tremble, and crack, and turn, dart. Um, those are all words which gives us a feeling of continuous movement in the last stanza. There's repetition again of words, and that, those help, the, the repetition helps to emphasize the power of the wind and the powerlessness of everything in its wake. In other words, you have the strength of the wind, and then you have um, the powerlessness of the people and the village itself against the strength thereof. So the wind whistles by and trees bend to let it pass. That particularly shows us how even a strong tree um, is not able to stand against the strength or the power of the wind. Um, where are we now? In stanza 2, it's repeated as the wind whistles by, whilst the trees bend to let it pass. In stanza 3, in stanza 1, the poet uses the word madman in line 9, and the word madly in stanza 3, you can see they've used it again, madly and, and madman, and so those words connect. In stanza 3, in line 24, what does it do? They use the words madman and madly to emphasize how irrational the storm is. Finally, the words associated with the children and women emphasize their helplessness, that's what it does, in the face of the storm. The children scream, babies are clinging to women, the women dart about madly, and uh, their clothes are torn off by the wind and wave like tattered flags. So it emphasizes their helplessness in the face of the storm. Here we go. Let's talk about the tone and the mood in the poem. Tone is the way words are used, and, and that tone creates a mood in the poem, obviously. Mood has to do with feeling. How does the, the poem make you feel? How do the words that they use make you feel? Okay. While this poem is dynamic and echoes the energy of the storm, the tone is ominous. You know, that means that something bad or something eerie is going to happen. And they use words like plague and madman. They use, in stanza one, there's a dark, sinister feeling, um, madly, jagged, blinding. Jagged is when you have, um, I was going to say, one of those, those knives, that when you have paper that could be jagged. You have knives that are jagged. Um, so the jagged blinding, there's rumble, tremble, there's crack. All of these give you um, the, the feeling of eeriness, the feeling of um, that something bad is going to happen. Um, and all of these words contribute to an uneasy, uncomfortable mood. Uneasy, uncomfortable mood in stanzas 2 and 3, as well as stanzas one, stanza 1. This ominous tone contributes to the idea. So there's an ominous tone, but there's an uncomfortable or an uneasy, which leads to an uncomfortable or uneasy mood. It symbolizes the destruction caused by colonialism. The storm comes like a plague of locusts, which causes starvation and it tears off women's clothing, taking what little they have left, the short, uneven lines, especially in line 3, which brings the climax of the storm, help create a mood of chaos and devastation. A mood of chaos and devastation. Then we have important points in the block that we, blocks we always refer to. Please have a look at that and please go through them um, stanza by stanza. Again, you'll see stanza 1, there's free verse and there's varying line lengths. The content, the speaker describes the approaching storm. The poetic devices used are the comparisons or similes, then the, the extensive use of verbs denoting physical action and what is the effect. It warns of bad things to come and the power of the storm itself. As you go through it, you'll see in these, in these blocks, stanza 2, um, what form is being used, the content, what, it, what the speaker is trying to say. In this instance, the approaching clouds and winds. There's the poetic devices in stanza 2, personification, through pregnant clouds, what does it mean? It suggests a possibility of a life-giving force, but then 
This is overridden by the sinister winds. Here's your metaphor. Um, the clouds perch and have wings like an animal. It's overridden by the sinister winds. Stanza 3, again fevers, uneven um, lines to emphasize the chaos. Whenever they ask about the, why discuss the, the, the form and structure of the poem, they're going to refer to the uneven lines. You're going to refer to the fact that there's um, enjambment present. Why? It's to emphasize the chaos of the storm. Then the storm hits the village and we see the effects on the women and the children. There are similes and metaphors that compare the storm to a very destructive force. Um, it's sound, the sound devices like onomatopoeia and alliteration in din and whirling. Let's talk about um, what the effects are. And the similes make you feel the fear that the, uh, the people felt in the face of this brutal violence and chaos. And then these harsh sounds, din and whirling, underline the fear and devastation the form causes. You obviously have uh, a list of questions that you need to go through and answer. Um, as best as you possibly can for your own sanity. Please answer all of those questions and then go through this poem again. Um, yes, I do want to read something about the poet in, in, in closing um, so that you understand why they keep on referring back to colonialism in the poem. And let's look at the background of it so that we understand um, what the backdrop is of this particular poem. So the guy, uh, James David uh, Rubadiri, was born in Malawi and went to school in Uganda. He developed a love of literature at primary school, started writing at a very young age, he went to Makerere University in Kampala, Uganda, and then studied English literature in Cambridge at the Cambridge University in, in Britain. Malawi won its independence. This is important. In other words, they were co colonized before this. They won its independence from Britain in 1964, and Rubadri was appointed Malawi's ambassador to, to the United States. However, he became increasingly opposed to the undemocratic um, leadership of President Banda and went to exile in Uganda. When the Ugandan dictator Idi Amin took power, Rubadri, Rubadri was again forced into exile in Kenya, where he became a lecturer at the University of Nairobi. After Banda's death in 1997, Rubadri was Malawi's ambassador to the United Nations until he retired. His poetry has been widely published and An African Thunderstorm is one of the most anthologized poems in Africa. Thank you so much everyone. I hope you um, got something out of this particular lesson and I hope to see you guys soon again. Uh, enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you.